If you're an NP looking for a job, you've submitted a ton of applications but received very few calls, the problem could be a resume or maybe it's just you. Or here's another situation, maybe you're getting calls, going on interviews, killing it, but still not getting offers. Could be that the competition is just super fierce, or it could be that there are concerns about your candidacy, but how would you even know this? I'm gonna help you out with that. In this video, I'm gonna talk about common concerns that employers have regarding candidates. And for each one, I'm gonna explain why it would be an issue, rank it by severity, and tell you how to minimize the impact on both your resume and your verbal communication in the formal interview so that you can shine as the phenomenal catch that you really are. If we haven't met yet, my name is Bree. I'm an RNNP mentor, interview strategist, content creator, and educator. Welcome to the channel. few caveats that apply to all of the things I'm about to discuss today, and that is thusly. <laughs> the weight of these concerns are going to vary greatly based upon the specialty. What matters to some people in some settings matters not at all in another. Um, the other dynamic is team needs. How many people do they need to do this work? Is this a vacant position? Like they're more desperate, like red flags may be more acceptable um, because they're in a place of need. Or is this team growth? Maybe they've got a little bit more time to curate just the right people. So timing matters a bit too, how soon they need this to happen. And lastly, market competition, which is probably the most issue here. So if there are a lot of candidates out there, they're going to be more picky. Overall, what I'm about to share with you, they are gross generalizations, okay? So bear that in mind as we have this discussion. Before we get into this, I want to let you know that you can sit in on a recording from a live mock interview that I did with an actual nurse practitioner client who was getting ready for an interview. And you can witness some of the strategies that I'm going to tell you about firsthand and see how I give her like specific strategies for her unique set of challenges. So it looks like this, and there's going to be a link in the description below. So if this kind of content resonates with where you're at in life right now, do be sure to check out that video. Signs that you might be giving red flags. Number one, there's a lot of training, maybe even too much training that's required. How would you know this? Well, you might be a new grad or the previous experience you have is in a completely different field. Like you were an acute care NP working for an inpatient palliative care position and now you're applying for an outpatient um, surgical or orthopedic position, like some type of clinic work that's highly specialized. Why is this a problem? Well, for obvious reasons, it takes time to train people. It takes time and therefore money to train new orientees. So the less time it takes to teach you, the sooner you will be a producer for the team. Because never forget, as an NP, our role is different now because we bring money to the practice. We are revenue generators. They want us up and running fast. So they already have the battle of credentialing, which slows down things significantly by the tune of several months on the short end, as far as bringing you in and getting you producing. How does it rank on the severity scale? I'm going to give it just one red flag. It may be a big deal to some people, but most of the positions in which this is a big barrier, they'll list that in the job posting, experience required. You know, for most teams, they understand the inherent benefits that can come with hiring someone with no or little experience. So what's the solution to this? First of all, on your resume, it's crucial, crucial that you highlight the NP experience you have first. That should be the first thing you see. So put your NP rotations at the top and make sure it has weight. Bulk this portion up and pare down the RN portion. It matters because what takes up the most real estate on your resume is how they're going to see you. So if the majority of your resume is your RN experience, that's how they're going to see you. Instead, spend more time sharing what you did in your rotations, who the reference is, how many hours you spent, top diagnoses you treated so they can get a feel for you as a candidate, like how much do they need to train you. And if you're changing specialties, the same advice applies. Just bulk up the section where you talk about what you've done as an NP. 
and ensure that you have a multitude of references in plain sight. This implies confidence in your capabilities and your personality, which is what they would ask if they called this reference. Also, use buzzwords like passion and commitment in your interview. Let them know that this is exactly where you want to be and you are committed to this team. On top of that, you are easily trained. If you're a new MP, friends, do not fear, okay? In some respects, this is a benefit. You come without bias, you're eager to learn, you bring lots of excitement and overall tend to be less jaded in your outlook than some experienced NPs are. So you have fewer bad habits for us to overcome. In your interview, have a well thought out discussion about your preferred learning style and an anticipation of what you will need in regards to training. The easier it is for them to see how long it will take to train you, the more they will see you as an insightful person who knows how to anticipate and handle challenges. You're just already making their work easier. Next up are commitment concerns. How do you know this is you? You may have a track record for short tenures at previous jobs or your experience is in a completely unrelated field, which would be a concern because my thought is if you've spent 20 years doing one particular thing, how do I know you're going to like this thing, right? So why is this a problem? Employers fear the churn and burn. They spend time and money training you and you leave maybe in a short time frame only for them to have to start this whole process all over again. And this is a nightmare. So it's a pretty decent concern. Um, here's an example. You're passionate about neurology all your time as a nurse and much of your clinical training time in school has been in neurology units. Then I'm a little bit worried if you're applying for a cardiac CVICU position that you're applying out of a place of desperation because you want something and not necessarily because you want this thing. So I worry that you're going to find fulfillment in this specialty. You're going to burn out and leave me high and dry because the bottom line is if you don't like the work and the patient population, nothing else really matters and you have a high likelihood of leaving. So specifically in regards to the short tenures, the concern on the employer's part is that this could be one of two issues. Either you have interpersonal problems, which is a big concern, or you haven't found what it is that you love, both of which are fairly high risk investments for the employer. So how severe is this? I'm going to give it two red flags for the different specialty and three red flags for the high turnover. Personally, the latter of the two is the most concerning to me. Um, I think personality red flags are the highest because you can teach away inexperience, but you can't teach away bad personality. <laughs> so what's the solution? On your resume in the highlights professional objective section at the top, make a statement along the lines of um, well-rounded, experienced NP with a multitude of passions and commitment to learning, high standards for self-excellence. By the way, you may want to spend some time reviewing your resume closely. And in this video, which I will link below, you can discover the biggest no-nos that I see commonly on resumes. So in the interview, when they ask why you've had so many jobs, I suggest you answer something like, I've always been a curious person. I dive deep into the unknown and I work tirelessly until I feel confident in my understanding. This is largely a positive trait and demonstrates how committed I am to delivering high quality care particularly where human lives are concerned. It can be a flaw, however, when I let my curiosity take me down paths that end up not fulfilling my passions, and then I have to move to something else that fills me up. Rest assured, this role is exactly where I wanna be, and I'm committed to this specialty and this team. In return, you gain a self-motivated learner who always strives for clinical excellence. Next up, we're gonna talk about one of my biggest red flag concerns, but first, a quick message about interview skills and how I can help you land your dream job. Are you a new or perhaps an experienced NP looking for your next NP job and you are sick and tired of submitting your resume off into the great beyond and having no clue where it's going? Or going to interviews, struggling your way through them, feeling super awkward and leaving feeling very deflated? Imagine yourself sitting in the driver's seat, finally negotiating your dream job contract with confidence. This kind of power in negotiation comes from possessing leverage, and you obtain this when you have the employer so sold on your skills and talents that no other nurse practitioner will do. 
I can help you gain this type of leverage by teaching you how to illustrate your value proposition via the formal interview. You just got to stand out from the crowd. And there's hope. Interviewing is not some special talent that only the chosen few possess. This is an easily learned skill set. It starts with identifying weaknesses, preparing responses and questions, and practicing. I help new and experienced NPs land their dream job by teaching them expert level interview skills via a digital course and strategizing a unique approach via mock interviews. The investment of time, effort, and a little bit of money will reap dividends for years to come. It is a competitive market, no doubt, but saturation is not the right word. There is a place for you, my friend. If you have further interest in this, please go check out my website at brianp.com. And as always, thanks so much for supporting this channel and watching these videos. Okay, moving on. Thirdly, personality problems. How do you know if this is you? Well, you may not know. My guess is if you have some big red flags here, you don't know they are a problem or that others would see it as such. Because most of us as human beings, we lack emotional intelligence. And that is the ability to look inwardly, to control your own emotions in response to situations, as well as to understand the emotions of others. So EQ impacts every aspect of your life. And at work, it has a major impact on your ability to handle situations in which you feel any of the unpleasant emotions that come associated with things, doing things that you don't want to do or working with people you don't like, which is all of us, right? So the higher your emotional intelligence, the more pleasant you are to work with and the more capable you appear. Let me give you some examples of how things appear from behind the desk. So sometimes candidates come across as conceited or condescending. So here's an example. When asked how you handle difficult coworkers, your story involves resolution in which the other person was completely at fault and they were held responsible. You know, any story in which the self-reflection is lacking because disagreements are never one-sided and you do not illustrate the ability to reflect inwardly on your own flaws and contributions to discord if your story only involves what the other person has done wrong. Another way in which you can come across this way is you make excessive or uncalled for disparaging comments in your interview about people that you work with. You very well may work with some of the most toxic people on earth and it is legitimate, but this is not something you want to share in an interview with people you don't know. So here's another example from behind the desk. Some people come across as overly demanding. Now this is subtle, right? And the line is very fine and hard to see between having experience and confidence and knowing thyself versus being a diva. So let me illustrate. You're asked about why you're leaving your current job and you go beyond the objective retelling of an unpleasant workplace and you segue into ranting. At my current job, I'm required to do way too much work. I realized pretty quickly that I do not like working with trainees, which we have a lot of because we have a residency and fellowship program at our institution. It was not in my job description, nor was I hired to teach trainees, and I'm doing it constantly. I told my boss I don't have time to do all this workload, plus teach the new people. They need to figure out a better solution. That's their job. That's why I'm looking for work elsewhere. Why is this such a big concern for employers? Okay. Usually, it's less obvious than the examples I gave you, but even subtle hints during an interview can raise major red flags. For me, this is one of the biggest red flags of them all. I mean, if you can't keep your crazy, your overly passionate, your conceitedness, your ego tucked away for an hour, what's it going to be like once they acquire you? Are you going to create more problems for them? It's nearly impossible to ascertain this in a short one hour formal interview. This is why some teams will have multiple stage interviews over the course of hours or days, or they'll ask you to come in for a shadow day. People hire for personality. How severe is this? I give it three red flags. What's the solution? Well, you likely won't have any red flags on this arena on your resume, but regarding the trainee story, in the interview, instead of saying the way it was said in the example, try saying something like this. At my current job, I feel the workload's just not evenly distributed. I'm the only person seeing a census of 12 to 14 patients while also orienting the new folks and the trainees. 
I've suggested a more balanced workflow rotation schedule, but my team lead, they don't like to onboard either. And therefore, they don't want to honor any request of shared equity. So this is a hard line for me. I desire to work for a team who values all their employees and is willing to listen to solutions to balance of workload. Hopefully you noticed a big difference in the presentation. It was the same exact story, same exact situation, but presented differently. And a lot of it has to do with the way that these two different people, if you will, experience the hardship they were going through. One person saw it as an opportunity for growth. One person saw it as a constant dog pile on themselves. So it's all an outlook. And so it is a reflection of who you are as a person. The second presentation was not one to put blame on anybody else. Big difference. So all in how you choose to share the story. Next, I'm gonna go through a series of major red flags that are extremely challenging to overcome. <clears throat> First up would be legal issues. If you've been sued for malpractice or sexual harassment, basically anything legal, workplace related, this is a major red flag, probably to the tune of like four. A lot of places will have like absolutes in place in regards to this being a no hire situation. In this case, your best approach is to search far and wide for small private practice options in which you can meet in person with another human being and share your story openly with narrative and dialogue exchanging of the concerns. You can tell the story more objectively and then you can sell them hard on the talents and the skills that you do bring to the table and show them how they overcome some of the background legal concerns that you've had. I also want to add here, I highly suggest you seek legal counsel. There may be an option available to you where you can expunge your record. Next up, they're kind of same problem, different situations. So pregnancy or impending move. These are situations in which the person I'm about to hire is about to leave. This is a concern. It could be a major red flag or it could just be a speed bump. It depends on the team dynamic, what they need, the type of owner, director to which you're appealing. And you can either disclose or not. Um, I do not believe you are required to do so. And there is definitely legal implications to them asking at all. Equal opportunity means that they cannot discriminate. Although many self-owned like private practice clinics, they don't need to adhere to this. So my suggestion is share as much vulnerability as you are comfortable doing. They're going to find out eventually, and this could make for a very distrusting workplace if you did not disclose this at the beginning. You know, the thing about it is you may find that their values, motives, and needs align very closely with yours. Maybe your clinic owner is also getting ready to be a mom and is very is more sensitive to the needs of you being a parent first and foremost. Or maybe they're in a situation where they have a potential hire coming up that they really wanted to hire and you would bridge the gap in a six month to one year time frame if you're planning on going somewhere else. So I encourage you to be as vulnerable as you're willing to be. It will set you up for more success and more trusting relationship with your future employers if you share. Lastly is the biggest red flag of them all, and that would be poor references. If you've had issues in former workplaces and they find out this will be tough to overcome. Y'all, healthcare is a small world. We all talk. So if the resounding feedback is that this person is a nightmare to work with, they're gonna find major issues overcoming this because people talk and people's personalities in general don't tend to change. To me, this is the highest severity, like four plus 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 red flags, because again, personality. So here's my suggestion on how to handle it. Depending on the questions they ask, just try not to deflect on others. Instead, show accountability and growth. How have you changed and what will you bring to the table this go round in regards to personal efforts to improve relations? Just own it, you know? At my last workplace, I was young and had a little bit of ego. I have since been put in my place. I kind of know that this is a team effort and I intend to go forward with a different style of communication because I've heard feedback that I can be condescending. And in my mind, I have never intended to be condescending. 
So to show ownership and growth, I actually feel like this is sort of an underdog that I would probably stick my neck out for more than someone who didn't because this is someone who's got the EQ, right? They've done the work. They're willing to admit their flaws and they're willing to change and grow. I know this is all stuff you don't want to hear, but my guess is if you're watching this, you're the type of person who does not shy away from difficult discussions. So kudos to you, my friend. Inward reflection on our flaws is hard stuff that only the brave and enlightened are typically willing to work on. So I applaud you for going down this rabbit hole and for opening the door to self-work. In the end, you will experience more peace and be richly rewarded for doing so. Don't forget, you are perfectly designed and equipped to handle the unique challenges that you face. You're a catch, and they need to sell themselves to you as much as you need to sell yourself to them. So if you are wondering what questions to ask to make sure that this is a good fit for you, check out this giant list of 52 questions to ask the employer to ensure that they are perfect for you. And you can get this for free when you sign up for the newsletter email list on my website at brianp.com and the link for that will be down below as well. Thanks so much for watching and good luck friends.